Um, one more thing on the retreat, the writer, the author of our Bible study is actually our speaker. So that's kind of fun to be able to, to see her in person and hear her speak in person. Um, I can't believe we got her coming. She is a much in demand speaker and works for the Gospel Coalition. And so I'm really excited that our little church gets to have her come and, and share her wisdom with us. So. Be sure, that's, it's going to be a great little day in Granbury. We're going to have a little day away. And you can spend the night if you want, but definitely a day away. So, um, so this, is, this is one of those lessons I needed a lot of help with, so I got it from people like Dan Doriani and other commentators. I want to give them credit. But I also just want us to start off by reading our passage, and we're going to um, just kind of keep your finger there because um, I'll be referring back to it. Um, James 2, and we'll start where our homework starts in verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messenger and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Okay, so if you have your hand out, we're going we're gonna to kind of divide this up in three ways. First of all, we're going to define faith and works. Let's just get, get our definitions right. Then we're going to look at four case studies to illustrate these definitions. And then we're going to see how Paul and Jesus were on the same page as James because some of this sounds not like things we've heard other people say in the Bible, and that's why it can be really confusing. And, and you know, it's okay if it's not, we can't figure it out perfectly. We've got to have to hold that tension a little bit, and that's okay. There are lots of things in the Bible that we're just like, okay, I'm not understanding how both of these can be true, but, but all of Scripture is inspired by God, and we look at all of Scripture to really come down to these definitions of faith and works. So first of all, um, if you looked at faith, like just a basic definition of faith is trusting on Christ's work alone for your salvation. This does, this does not, there's no room in this definition for you've got to do something to earn your salvation. You've got to be good enough. You've got to clean yourself up before you can go to Jesus. That's like me trying to get better before I go to the doctor. No, you go to the doctor when you're sick so he can help you. Um, it does mean that you say something, that you believe something, that you, um, you, you trust Jesus and what he did on the cross. Romans 10, 9 says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be saved. It does not say if you go do this and this and this and this, then God will think about it. No. It's saying, look, if you take on Jesus as your Savior and your Lord, and then, now sometimes we've gone, hey, Jesus saved me from my sins, but really he became my Lord this year. Th that's not theologically correct. Jesus can't be just your Savior. He must be your Lord, too. You must, when it says trust Him, that means letting go of all things to hold on to Him. 
That's like if my baby wanted to hold on to me because he or she is scared, she wouldn't just be holding all her toys in her arms. She would let go of them and cling to me. And that's what salvation looks like. Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace, that means a free gift, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. That even the thing that we might say, like, we have to have a heart that can choose God, even that was given to us. Because we were dead in our trespasses and sins, and Jesus takes a dead heart out and gives us a live heart that clings to him and goes towards him. In the Presbyterian's Catechism, the definition of faith is a saving grace whereby we receive and rest upon Christ alone for our salvation as he is offered to us in the gospel. <coughs> So faith looks like a gift, it looks like a decision, it looks like a life, it looks like a means of holding on to God and his promises because it joins us to Christ. And because it joins us to Christ, it cannot be lifeless because Christ is so alive. So if we are joined to Christ, of course we're going to have life and we're going to see things happen. So in my Bible, I have this gray box of stuff, and I got this from this. It was so helpful. There are three steps of faith. First of all, there's knowledge. I understand this good news. I understand that Jesus is saying, if I believe in him, he will, he will save me. I know that in my head. And then I may even take the next step, which I agree. I agree. I believe that. I believe that. I think that that is true. But that third step is the essential one, where I trust him. And the best thing, and it's not original to me, and it's so boring, I wish I could have thought of a better illustration, but it's the whole illustration of you look at a chair. I say, that's a chair. I see it, I recognize it, that's a chair. Then I believe, I think that chair would hold me. I think it's strong enough, if I sat in it, that it would hold me. But I'm really not showing or having true faith until I actually sit in it and I test it and I say, God, are you really strong enough? I believe it. I acknowledge that it's true, but it's, it's really your, until you act on it, until you trust him, it's not complete. So that is our working definition today of faith. It is something God gives us. It's something that will lead to something though, because it's alive. It's, it means something's happening. And what it leads to is works. Another way to put this is fruit. I think fruit may be an easier way for us to understand because who, who all goes and plants a fruit? Who all goes and says the tree started with the fruit? Nobody. The tree started with the seed. It started with something that was alive in the ground that grew and produced the end product, which is fruit. So let's think of these works that, that James is talking about as the fruit of faith. Um, in first Corin I mean, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 18, we hear that we are a new creation that will produce fruit. We're not where the old things have passed away and there's something new. So faith has to come first, like the seed. That new heart and that gift of salvation has to be the thing that comes first. That's the horse. Then the cart are the works. So if you get the works in front, if you get the cart before the horse, that's messed up. That means you're trying to earn your salvation. But this is the cart is after the horse. The works come as a natural, natural thing after, after faith. Faith actually promotes good works, and actually what's amazing is good works then mature your faith, which is, it's just, I'm not saying we're going to all understand it, it's a mystery, but that, that's how this, this relationship works. The more I do good works out of this faith, the more it makes my faith stronger and more robust. One of the ways I understand this, if you're a baker, and my dad taught me this before, and see, I'm really bad at bread. I can't do bread very well. I really wish I could be that person that makes homemade cinnamon rolls. I just, those homemade yeast rolls, oh, they're the best. But anyway, so I was trying to do it. And the thing my dad told me to do is you have to proof the yeast first. 
don't just see I was just gonna dump the yeast in the water and dump it in the dough and not not do anything else but just add it like I would for any recipe he goes no you've got to make sure you, your yeast will work so what you do is you put it in some warm water and you watch it and you see if it starts bubbling and sure enough I've had yeast that bubbles and yeast that does not bubble and if it does not bubble throw it out it's not gonna do anything and faith is like that yeast it says yeast on the package a lot of us may say, I'm a Christian, I have faith, and we have the label, but your good works are the bubbles. Are you bubbling, or is it just a package label? So, the good works James is talking about is talking about the bubbles of the yeast. They show what is invisible to men and women. God sees the heart, he knows. But the good works are what makes what is invisible visible to those around us and really to ourselves too. Because I know the heart is deceitful above all things. And sometimes I need to do a self-examination and go, do I really believe? Is Jesus really my savior? Am I really giving my life to him? Do I see any fruit? Do I see any bubbles? Do I see any good works? But James is pretty provocative in how he's throwing this out there. And I think it's almost like he's wanting to shake up his audience. He's, he has such a pastor's heart for the churches where this letter is going that he almost wants to shake them up. And they're going, what did he just say? Wait a minute. I, I, we're supposed to be saved just by Jesus. Why is he saying we have to have good works? Isn't that wrong? And we too kind of go, what? But what he's really saying is, if you are saying you're saved by this fake faith, by just the label faith, it's dead. And you must have a faith that includes the reaction of the bubbles, of the good works. And so this audience, if you think about his audience versus, say, Paul's audience, Paul is usually talking to Gentiles who really, really need to hear, it. you do not need to get circumcised to become a Christian. That is, a, that is a work that you that does not save you. And he had to really beat them over the head with that. James has to beat his people over the head with, hey, are you doing the things a Christian should do? Here's what the young church should be producing. Or are you just resting on your laurels and saying, we grew up Jewish. We know the new Jesus. We know what we're doing. And really, are they having more faith in their knowledge than in the salvation that Jesus gave them? So, we too may need our confidence shaken a little bit and thinking, okay, do I have bubbles? Do I have bubbles in my life? And James uses four case studies to prove what he's saying. So, the first is an, un, I'm calling an unhelpful sister because it's addressed to brothers and sisters. Um, and then the demons with good theology. Father Abraham, and then, you know, like every other example, a hooker from, you know, Jericho. <laughs> so, so he covers it all. I will say that. Now, a couple of these are negative examples, and a couple are positive examples. So we're going to just look at these. This is what James is teaching us through, so we're going to really dig into these four case studies. So let's look at chapter 2, verse 15 through 17. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food. And one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Okay, this is a negative example. This is, he is saying a faith that is alive, a faith that has fruit, a faith that bubbles like good yeast, is gonna meet the needs of the poor. And it's not going to be the kind where somebody says, I need something, and you're going to say, oh, I sure hope that works out for you, or I'll add you to the prayer chain. It's, it's a faith that can't help but be empathetic. It can't help but remember how you have been vulnerable, and therefore you want to help someone else in their vulnerability. It's not a dead faith that just puts religious ketchup on a comment or a trite, oh, here's a Bible verse to help you on your way. Um, this can look like, well, I'll tell you one thing that this is a silly example, but back in Mississippi, I went through like 
a, a couple of six month periods of time where I could not drive. I had some sickness stuff going on and I could not drive. And I'm telling you with five little kids, that is a problem. <laughs> and so I would walk a lot of places. And so say somebody dropped me off, I could walk home. And I remember walking home one day and I really was hoping somebody I knew would pass me by and give me a ride. <laughs> Cause it wasn't like I was exercising, you know, <laughs> I had on my non-exercise clothes in my purse, you know, so I'm not exercising. And I remember somebody I knew drove by me and she just waved at me. <laughs> and I was like, don't just wave at me, come get me, you know, <laughs> don't leave me here on this hill. And so sometimes it's kind of like that. It's like, hey, have fun. I love you, I see you, and you're like, the person's like, no, I really need a ride. The wave is great, but I really need a ride. This can look like a single mom trying to get to the car. Can you help her? Can you, can you just step out of yourself enough to even see that she's struggling? Maybe she needs help. Can you imagine a single mom at any point not needing a, a Target card? Heck you would get a target card right now and be excited, you know? So think about thinking of what are ways that could really make this woman feel seen by God? Are there things that can really make her feel helped? Like legitimate, she needs milk, she needs diapers, she needs some clothes. What about the person who's just lost his job? I mean, we're so uncomfortable dealing with, with sad things like that that you may almost be embarrassed to help. But I can tell you, there are people who literally, they look like they're okay, and they're freaking out about how to pay their rent. Um, what about the person who may not need something to wear or to eat, like in James, but is so lonely in the middle of a full room? And it, it, maybe she's socially awkward. Maybe, maybe she's just not your best friend and you have some other friends you wanna catch up with. Is it sharing, is it being kind and giving to clothe her with attention and with company so that she's just seen and not feeling such like an outsider? There are lots of ways that maybe personally you can do this. And then if you go, I don't even know if I can start there. What I love about Trinity's ministries is that there is a way to start that they make it real easy. So like an asylum seeker, I knew there was a problem, but what was I supposed to do? And I move here and I'm like, what? There's actually a, a ministry and our church actually, like there's somebody I could talk to about it or they bring opportunities you can take groceries. You can actually do James. You can actually do this to people who literally cannot work in our country. You can be the person that James is talking about. Pregnancy Lifeline, that mother wanting to get an abortion because she is so scared. You can be the person. You can donate on the Church Center app to Crates for Ukraine instead of buying that new sweater. These are, these are really, this is meddlesome what I'm doing right now, but this is, I'm, I'm trying to make it earthy for you and real for you. Sometimes you don't know where to start, and I'm telling you there are places in Trinity at the very least that will give you one step. One step if maybe you don't know someone without a job, you don't know someone who's single with kids, maybe, maybe it's a prayer for the asylum seeker or the net or River Tree and those families that are, are literally could be living in a car. There are real needs and James is saying an unhelpful sister does not have true faith because the kind of faith I'm talking about is alive and the kind of faith that does nothing for someone is the yeast that is dead. But the kind that does it is the kind of yeast that bubbles. In Matthew 25, Jesus is talking to, to people and saying, Look, when you helped my disciples, 
when you visited them in prison, when you fed them, when you gave them water, when you helped them when they were sick, you were helping me. And the response is, when did we see you like that, Jesus? And he's saying, when you, you did it to my, my people, you did it to me. So when you do these things, picture Christ. Picture Christ. The next example, the ne next case study is kind of freaky because it's talking about demons with good theology. <laughs> James 2, 18 through 20. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? This kind of seems to say, when it says, you have faith and I have works, what it's really kind of doing, somebody explained this to me, is it's saying, look, I'm the type that believes, and you're the type that does, and we just get along great. And James is like saying, X and A on that. <laughs> no. You have to have faith and works always are together. They're always together. So you can't divide it up and say, well, I believe in Jesus, but, you know, my, you know that's just kind of where I'm comfortable. And you're a doer. No, it, it goes hand in hand. But this is the thing that's interesting. He's saying demons have the right theology. You know, a demon believes in Jesus. A demon believes that there's only one God. But he's not saved by this mere knowing. He, he knows it's true. But his work is shuddering and trembling because he's not on the same page as God. He is an enemy of God. And James is saying, if you don't have faith that's alive, you're basically on the same page as the demons who believe God, but don't trust in him and don't have faith. And this is pretty much like the nominal just churchgoers, people who say, I'm a Christian, but there's nothing else to their lives that looks like Christ. Because true faith goes beyond facts to acts. Okay? It goes beyond facts about God to acts for God. This action is always associated with, with um, faith. So the unhelpful sister, her, her, she was useless to mankind. The demons are useless to God. Now, our next two case studies are positive. First of all, uh, it's Abraham. So let's look at verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Okay, so I want to just walk through Abraham's story real quickly. Let's just kind of think about what James was talking about, about Abraham and his faith. And what's this about sacrificing somebody? This is really, really cray-cray. Um, so if you see, you know, Romans talks about this. Abraham believed God and was counted to him as righteousness. That's that faith, okay? And we see in Genesis 12 that God calls Abraham out of his pagan lifestyle, out of his pagan everything he knew, and, and we see Abraham actually walking out and having a new life. Then we see in Genesis 15 God is promising that he will have all these descendants. God will bless him to be a mighty people, of course, his wife doesn't have a baby. He has no baby. But then we see later, even though God has promised Abraham, and even though Abraham believes him and has faith, he, his faith falters. And he goes and has another son with a, another woman. And Ishmael is born. And this would be a work that is illustrating what's going on in his heart. So by the time we get to where God calls him, he has the son of promise, Isaac. He has him. And then God says to him, 
I want you to go take Isaac, your only son, the son that the promise is through. I want you to go sacrifice him. What we see Abraham do illustrates the faith that is strong in his heart. God knew, God knew his faith. God, God could see his heart and knew how Abraham felt about God. But we get to see his faith by what he does next, which is he did not wait. He got up the next morning. I bet you he did not tell Sarah what he was thinking or doing because she would have had a fit. Um, he tells his people that we, Isaac and he, are going up to sacrifice and we will come back. And the writer of Hebrews tells us, gives us a clue as to what was going on in Abraham's mind, that he judged God faithful, that he was going to raise Isaac from the dead. That's the only way he knew this would make sense, is that's, the, that's what's going to happen. Now, had Abraham seen that happen a lot? No. It took great faith for him to get to the point where he has the knife out, and God provides the ram and says, stop. I know, I know, I see your good works. I see what your heart is beating for me, that you would give up your most precious possession and that you would trust me that after I've promised you that it is only through Isaac all my promises will happen, that you knew that I was mighty enough to fix it, to still keep my promises. This is useful for God. These are good works that are useful for God. And this is our positive example of what faith's works look like. Some good bubbles happening here. And then he brings in the opposite of Father Abraham. He brings us a Gentile woman who's a prostitute in Jericho. Let's look at James 2, uh, verse 25 through 26. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So we have a huge contrast. And the, the, Father Abraham was like the good, good character. You know, it's like George Washington of the Jewish people. And then you had this outsider and this woman who had a ton of bad works. And it's so interesting, in the split second, if you know the story, she's in the wall of Jericho living, doing her business, and the spies from Israel came into her house, her condo in the wall or whatever, and she decided to go with God and leave her people. And the way we know that she had faith is not because she just said, I believe in this God that's surrounding and about to beat all of us. That would have been easy to say, right? But it's proven by what she does. And as she hid the spies, risked her life. And what I think is so interesting in the family of God, she was asking because she believed in God, she wants them to protect her and her family. But also the flip of that is by belonging to this family and this God, she needs to do the same thing to them. And so she truly gets this faith and this family idea of I'm part of this people and they're going to protect me and I'm going to protect them. And you can imagine, you know, how iffy a prostitute's testimony might be if she just said something. But the fact that she's acting like this proves. I don't know who watched the Super Bowl or who watched the halftime show. But pretty much Rihanna announced to the world she was pregnant in that red outfit, right? You saw all of a sudden we were like, is she pregnant? And sure enough, that, that's when social media blew up because they didn't know she was pregnant. Now, I didn't. I thought she, maybe everybody should have known that. I don't know. I just was like, well, go girl, get on that little thing, pregnant, you know? Um, anyway, if you didn't see it, go look at it on social media. You will see her red belly. Um, and I like that she kind of touched the belly and says some other places. Like, you know, that was appropriate. That was a good halftime show. Um, but anyway, at this point, like Rihanna announcing to the world, there is, a, there is something to see there. There was a belly bump, okay? Rahab has a belly bump that the world can see. She has faith. She has faith. 
This, this kind of faith was useful for mankind. This is the opposite of the, the not helpful sister. Okay, Abraham's faith was the opposite of the demons. His was useful for God. Now, James gives us those case studies because the conclusion of all the case studies together, each one and together, faith without works is dead. It is like yeast that does not bubble. It is like a tree that does not bear fruit. It is not right. It is not right, it is not alive, and it is not working. Now, you may, like I said earlier, this feels like maybe we're at odds with even what Jesus taught and what Paul taught. So on your handout, I've just given you verses that Jesus or Paul said that should sound just like James, okay? Because James said, has alluded in earlier in chapter 2 in verse 5 that there is a kind of faith that makes us heirs. Okay, he believes in this faith alone. It's just he's saying this faith that saves you is never alone, though. It's never alone itself. So let's look at Jesus. What did he say? Um, look at Matthew 7. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. Okay, this is when you look at your life and you go, am I producing thorns and thistles or good fruit? Now skip down to John 8. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. There is a family resemblance that should be going on. If you are alive, you will be doing things that look a certain way. And then John 15 you did not choose me, but I chose you, okay? Grace alone. I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide, okay? This shows, Jesus is saying, I saved, but there is a fruit to it. There is something else. Then Paul, in 1 Corinthians 3, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. There will be a time when your works will be judged. Were they works that were fruit of salvation, or were they just works that you were trying to be nice? You were trying to be the good girl. You were trying to look like you had it all together. Those works, those works are useless. Then look in Galatians 6. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. This is a little confusing to me. It's basically saying, don't compare yourself to your friend. Mind your own business. <laughs> look at your own works with you and Jesus. Don't say, but look how much better off than, her, than I am than my neighbor. Look at how her life is going to, you know, go into pot. You know, don't. Don't, don't do that. Think about you and Christ. Then Ephesians 2. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. We are saved. We are made perfect. Why? For good works. The good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is one of the most comforting verses and exciting verses. That God has saved you and then he has a plan. A plan for you to walk in that he has already prepared the way for and then finally, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor un uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith, the kind of faith working through love. So the big question is, are you on the same page as James and Jesus and Paul? Because in a room this big, there are women who may be having the label, but not, it's not alive. It's not a faith that is seen. Um, to others, to yourself. How do I know that my faith is real? Can you look at your life and say, do I see bubbles? Now, this does not mean you're perfect. This does not mean that you do not lose your temper and that you do not mess up every minute of every day. But do you struggle? Do you struggle forward? Do you struggle to obey? Do you, do you repent of when you do mess up? Do you pray? Do you struggle with Jesus and say, Jesus, why am I doing the things I don't want to do? 
Those are signs of life. Those things are bubbles. And if you look at your life and go, what is she talking about? <laughs> then let's talk. Let's talk because this is the day. This is the day that you can be saved. That you can talk to Jesus and say, Jesus, I need to sit in the chair. Because right now I'm looking at it from a distance. And it's a pretty chair. And it's a chair I want in my house. I want my children to know that chair. But I'm not really sitting in it. And I want to. Will you help me? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we want to sit in that chair. And um, Father, I pray that you would help us. Help us, Lord, to rest fully in you and your grace and to remember that grace as we do good works for your glory and for your kingdom and out of love for those who don't have anything, for out of love for those who are needy. Lord, help us to, um, to be able to sit quietly with you and, and really search our heart and examine our lives and go, do I have this true faith? And Lord, for those that um, are struggling to know what that is, I pray that you would reach into and give them that new heart that can only respond in faith. And Father, I pray for those who are in faith and that, that are struggling to obey, that you would give them joy, that you would give them encouragement. And that you would bless us, Father, just by these case studies of seeing how it's hard to have faith and it's hard to really act on our faith, but you give us the power to do that. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen.